as I said, my name is Christy Peters. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with me, I am head of the Science and Engineering Library here on campus, as well as eScience Initiatives. So I do a lot of data management related stuff in the course of my um, daily work. This is the first of, okay, that's not working. Okay, this is the first of nine workshops that, this, that the Research Data and Scholarly Communication Committee here inside of the University of Kentucky Libraries is offering this spring. Um, this is very much a general overview. So those of you who have a pretty good understanding of data management or who participated in the workshop that we had um, held here in the library system, last February. Some of this may be review, um, but hopefully there'll be some new content here too. It's not, um, there will not be complete overlap. So you see before you the list of future workshops. All of these were included in the email that I sent out to all of you. Um, if you are interested in participating in any of these, either virtually or in person, please register. We ask that you register so that we have a record of how many participants there were, how many people were, are interested in that sort of thing. Okay, so my objectives today, um, this is really going to be divided into two general parts. Um, I am going to provide an overview of some basic terminology that I think you commonly hear associated with data services in libraries, um, but that you might be a little confused about. So I will try to provide some clarification of those terms. Um, I will ask you, you can certainly ask me questions throughout the presentation, but I will stop after I finish that first half. Um, and then we'll go into sort of why it's important to manage data very generally. What, what, why should you care? Um, I will briefly go over UK's data retention policy, um, talk a little bit about federal data mandates, a little bit about the kinds of services that academic libraries or especially research libraries are offering um, in the area of data management services. And then for the activity, I do hope that there will be time for me to both get you logged into DMP tool and create an account. Um, I think that's the first step to actually being able to use it and talk to people about it. And then there's a case study and I brought copies here. I sent all of you um, who were participating in person and virtually a copy of the case study. Um, it is a very science-based case study, but I have modified it enough that I think it's pretty simple and easy to read. I didn't want to give you something that was super long. Um, and we will talk through the, the data management plan prompts for this case study, and I think it will help you sort of get a sense for um, data management and practice, right? Like, what do I do when I sit down with a researcher and talk to them about how to manage their data? I think actually seeing a case study and talking about these terms is way more beneficial than just talking about things in a very abstract way. So again, if you have questions, um, please feel free to ask either virtually or in person um, throughout the presentation. Okay, so I think many people, when they think data management, they think about big data, right? Because big data is in the news, whether you work in data services in an academic library um, or not. I think you hear this term, but it's a hard concept to kind of wrap your brain around. A lot of people assume that the researchers that we work with um, on campus, in my capacity with my data management responsibilities, I'm helping people with big data. That's not really the truth, um, and I'll explain why, but I thought I would sort of discuss big data in general um, to begin with. So here are a few examples of big data, um, social media, um, digital images with the metadata OCR sort of embedded within those images, web server, web server logs. These are all examples of big data, um, which tends to be characterized by a number of V words. I, for those of you, um, Sorry, this is a glitchy computer, so it should never blink out for long. Um, but the, the three V words that I think rise to the top of the list most often are volume, velocity, and variety. So with big data, we're talking about tremendous volume of data, um, a petabyte or more. Just to give you some context, a petabyte of data is a million gigabytes. So the flash drive that I brought my presentation into the classroom on is an eight gigabyte hard drive, or eight gigabyte flash drive. It would take 125,000 of those eight gigabyte flash drives full of information 
to comprise a single petabyte. So that's sort of the scale of data we're talking about when we're talking about big data. And with, with social media, um, especially, that's a great example. Um, we're talking about petabytes of data that are being generated every minute of every day, being transmitted very rapidly, which gets to velocity. You know, these things are created immediately. They are stored. You do analysis, um, visualization. All of this stuff happens just um, faster than you can blink your eye. So that is another characteristic of big data. And there tends to be a great deal of variety in big data. So the kind of data that we're accustomed to working with in the library, for example, tends to be structured, right? It's the kind of data that fits in a relational database or that you work with in a spreadsheet. It's very ordered. It's quite easy to analyze. We don't have to worry about outsourcing that kind of analysis. Um, but big data um, is often comprised of unstructured data as well. Social media, digital images, web server logs, these are all examples of um, big data that are unstructured, not the kind of data that we're used to dealing with. So then the question in a library context is, um, you know, do libraries, are we really in the business of dealing with big data ourselves? And I would say that we're sort of getting there, right? Um, not really, not yet, not as a complete community, but some libraries are becoming more involved than others. So linked data is a great example. And I decided, Catherine, our very own Catherine Leibarger was just um, at a conference and was tweeting about um, linked data. I think this might be a great example of a workshop we could do in the fall, um, perhaps on linked data. But anyway, linked data is all about enhancing the web through the addition of structured data. RDF is um, how we're doing that. This RDF stands for Resource Description Framework. Um, in terms of the benefit for the libraries, it's all about exposing are the metadata for our records to the community, right? So they can find our materials when they do web searches. Um, they don't have to know to look in, at the website for the University of Kentucky Libraries, right? They can find this information um, very easily if they're doing research in Africa, right? And they do a query um, and it matches something in our collection, they would find that and that would be very beneficial for them and it would be very beneficial for us as well. The Library of Congress has been working to provide um, RDF presentations of its um, authorities and vocabularies to help libraries in this regard. Um, some libraries are further along than others. It's not a priority all the time for libraries. We have so many other things to do, but it is something that the libraries are beginning to work on. Hadi Trust and Chronicling America are examples of big data level, in my mind, projects that libraries are undertaking in collaboration with other institutions. So Hadi Trust is a collaboration between academic and research institutions. Um, they have over the years digitized millions, over 11 million, I know it could be way more than that now, on um, books, right? So you're talking about big data and in terms of it being um, more unstructured than the data we typically work with. Um, it's certainly very large in volume. In terms of velocity, I would say the velocity really gets at the solution for researchers and how you deal with um, Hadi Trust and even Chronicling America material. So Hadi Trust uh, developed, it was a grant funded project, something called the Data Capsule, right? So using the Data Capsule, researchers can, if they want to do computational data mining of Hadi Trust materials, all they have to do is plug in an algorithm into this platform, right? The algorithm goes into the Hadi Trust system, it crunches the numbers, it spits back out the result, but the researcher never actually interacts with any individual items, so they get around copyright restrictions, right? So that's a problem. It's incredibly difficult to get copyright permissions for even one or two books sometimes. You certainly, if you wanted to do data mining of five million items in the Hadi Trust repository, you would never be able to um, get copyright permissions for all of those, but you don't have to using this system. So this is what I consider a big data solution for, um, you know, a, a library sort of led big data project. Chronicling America, the, many of the people here in the library are probably more familiar with even than I am. Um, this is a website associated with the National Digital Newspaper Program. Um, it's a partnership between the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress. 
to develop an internet-based um, database of US newspapers. So I know there are over five, five million pages in this system, perhaps even more than that now. And researchers use this database in a very similar way. They can go in and do data mining and different kinds of projects on that content. So these are by no means um, in all libraries, projects of this magnitude, but I do believe that libraries are sort of starting to get into the big data business. So research data is defined many ways, but one definition is the recorded factual material commonly accepted in the research community as necessary to validate research findings. So this is gonna vary greatly by discipline, right? The research data for a historian is gonna be very different from the research data for a civil engineer, right? So this is an area, it doesn't tend to be big data, um, while there are certainly researchers on any research university campus who do projects that are, have big data associated with them, in my experience, the researchers who need the most help with data management deal with much smaller scale of data. It tends to be much more structured, you know, much more easy to manipulate, but they just don't really know how to go about um, managing their data properly. Um, so, this is an area, though, where I feel like academic liaisons really have an important role to play. While I, as a, a librarian who provide data management services, I feel confident I could sit down with a researcher in any discipline, regardless of my knowledge of that domain, um, specific information, and help them with data management problems, because I think understanding of data management and how it works and the kinds of um, issues that people have to deal with is honestly more important than how well you know the content knowledge in that discipline. But there are things that are very specific within disciplines. For example, when we gave our data management workshop last February, I learned, even though I have a degree in the life sciences, that metadata in the life sciences is called annotation. I had no idea, right? If I had been working with a faculty member um, talking about data management and they mentioned annotation, it would have meant a very different thing to me. I think we would eventually get to what they were talking about, but this is an area where I feel like academic liaisons, even if you don't plan on ever being the point person for all things data management in your field, I think uh, you would serve as a really important mediator between the researcher and the person providing the data management services by having sort of that um, domain specific discipline specific data information um, at hand. So most data management services and academic libraries are very much a collaboration between whoever in the library provides data management services and academic liaison. So it's very rarely one person who, who does it all for everybody. Um, so that said, that was research data very generally. There are different kinds of um, research data. So observational data, this could be sensor readings, it could be survey results. Librarians, we love surveys, right? Um, experimental data is going to be much more prevalent in the sciences and engineering, maybe in the medical fields. Simulation data, I think people across disciplines create models for forecasting and things of that nature. Derived or compiled data, um, this is data mining. The Hadi Trust example is an example of um, a way that you would go in and do a data mining kind of project. Any given project could include all of these different types of research data, but it's important to understand the distinction because the way that you manage data really depends on the type of data you're trying to manage. So if you're sitting down with a researcher and you're talking to them about um, their research data management needs, it's important to understand that there are different kinds of data to ask them. Um, typically what um, people in library systems do when they sit down with a researcher is very much like a reference interview, right? Uh, you're asking different questions perhaps, but you're trying to get at the specifics of um, the, the research that they're working on, the issues that they have, because often, um, just like with the regular reference interview, um, the people who you're helping don't necessarily know what they don't know. They don't really um, always understand what they need, but they know they need something. So it's all about sort of going in and asking them enough questions to sort of tease out that information. 
So data management very generally um, relates, relates to the actions that contribute to effective storage preservation and reuse of data and documentation throughout the research life cycle. So it's, it's everything from um, conceptualization and creation of a data, man data management plan to sharing your data once you're done with the project. So the research data life cycle, um, you may have seen at conference presentations or, uh, you know, they're all over the place. There are a million different kinds. This is just one version that I like to use. Um, so research is never this linear. You know, I understand that. Um, the arrows can often go in many different directions. You might be working on all of these different aspects of a project at any given time. But I do think that this is helpful in just conceptualizing how a research project works. Um, and it helps sort of lead a conversation when you're talking with a researcher about their research data management needs. So it begins with project conceptualization, um, with creation of a data management plan, which researchers have not always thought about when they begin their research. Um, but funding agencies are now requiring that they submit a data management plan with grant proposals um, for very good reasons. And so now they're trying to think about that at the very beginning, and that's often when they have questions um, for us. So then we've got data collection and assurance. So this is just collecting your data, processing your data, which could be cleaning the data so that it can be analyzed, data analysis and everything that entails, determining what data it's important to preserve and archive long term, because it's very likely you don't need to preserve all of your data associated with the research project um, for long term storage and archiving. But faculty, they are researchers, they don't necessarily know what data it's important to keep. Publication and data sharing and data reuse. Um, these are all aspects that need to be addressed in data management plans. So it's important if you think you are ever going to interact with faculty um, about research data to at least have a general understanding of what these different aspects of data management life cycle entail. And storage and backup and security, you know, they are important to consider throughout the research data life cycle. Storage and backup here, um, I'm really referring to short-term data storage and backup as opposed to preservation and archiving, which is long-term um, preservation of research data. So this is something that I've been thinking about um, for a while. In my mind, there is a divide between the, the part of the research data life cycle that researchers, non-library researchers, are comfortable with and familiar with, and what librarians um, and library staff are comfortable with and familiar with. The researcher's all about getting the grant money and getting the project done, right? They're very focused on the front end of the research data life cycle. Um, you know, they want to go out, they want to collect their data, they want to publish those results so that they can get credit for them because that's sort of what they survive on, right? The back end of the research data life cycle falls much more under the traditional umbrella of library services. So archiving and preservation, publications and sharing data, I mean data is perhaps a new concept Concept, but these are still traditional library roles. So we tend to be much more comfortable with this aspect of the research data life cycle. I feel like, you know, there's a learning curve on both sides. Researchers obviously need to get more familiar and comfortable working in the um, last, last half of this life cycle. And it's important because you need to understand how you plan on archiving and preserving your data and how you plan on sharing your data and the provisions you're gonna make for reuse of your data. You need to understand those things when you create your data management plan before you begin doing the research. So it's fine to come to us once you're done and say, you know, I need a place to keep my data, but there are things that you would have done perhaps differently in the front half of this research data life cycle had you known that you needed to um, alter you know, perhaps the metadata that you are collecting, you know, maybe you need to collect certain metadata in order to be able to share your data in a certain way or to be able to allow for people to reuse your data in a certain way. If you don't know that when you do the project, then it may be too late, right, for you to go back and retroactively collect that information. And librarians, I think, and library staff, I, 
my sense is that many librarians and staff are very uncomfortable with research data services. And I think the reason for this is that there is an assumption on the part of us as um, librarians and, and staff that we really need to understand the discipline, right? We, need, we don't have a PhD in civil engineering or in history or in anthropology or whatever discipline um, we're providing support for. So who are we to presume that we can advise somebody on how to properly manage their data, right? And like I said at the beginning, um, I really don't think you need to have really in-depth um, domain specific knowledge, especially if you've got liaisons, right, who really have much easier access to that information. If it's a collaborative project and you're working with one another, it shouldn't be an issue. But even if you're not, you know, I, I don't have a degree in civil engineering, but I am confident I could sit down and help somebody in civil engineering work through their data management problems. I think it's just a mindset thing. I do believe, though, in order to do that, you have to have a general understanding of research data, the research data life cycle, and the kinds of issues that are attendant with that. So, um, you know, I think that's one reason why it's important for all librarians, even if you never plan on being a data librarian, um, to sort of have a very general understanding of um, research data management. And that gets me to, this is another soapbox, I guess, but I will just say that as librarians in a research library, we are faculty as well, right? We're expected to do research in our own right. So my answer to librarians who tell me, I'm not a data librarian, this doesn't matter to me, I really don't need to understand research data management, it's not important to what I do, I would argue that it is important to what you do if you ever plan on doing any kind of research in your own right and publishing it, because um, in that respect, you might not be providing advice to faculty or to graduate students outside of the library setting, but it's still important that you manage the data associated with your own research, um, you know, for the same reasons that it's important for faculty outside of the library to do so. So components of a DMP, um, which is, you know, an acronym for data management plan, this is based on NSF. NSF was really the leader when it came to requiring data management plans with grant proposals. Um, in 2011, January 2011, they began requiring a two-page um, document, no more than two-page document that outlines how you are going to manage the data associated with the project. Um, so it includes types of data, metadata standards, um, data sharing access, reuse, archiving. As you can see, these really do sort of align with the research data life cycle that I talked about a little bit to begin with. And some of these categories you would assume faculty would be really knowledgeable about, like metadata standards, for example. Anybody who does any kind of research project generates metadata, right? Uh, it's just inherent in gathering information. You can't gather information and use it if you don't create metadata. But they don't necessarily understand metadata as a concept. So it's really sitting down with them and helping them understand, yes, you're already capturing much of this information, but you're not necessarily doing it thoughtfully, and you're not necessarily doing it with an eye towards how you're gonna be sharing your data once the project is done. So in many of the cases, faculty and researchers, they already know some of these things. It's just putting them into context in, in terms of a data management plan. So those were some of the definitions um, that I wanted to go over. Do you guys have any questions about anything that I have talked about? Either online, Robert's looking online, um, or in here. Do you need clarification? Sure. OK. <laughs> OK, so Jamie Burton said preach. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. I'm not sure what that was related to, but we'll just assume it was for the whole thing. Um, all right, so if there aren't more questions, I will go on um, and start talking about why, just, why is it important to manage data very generally. So um, 
there are many reasons, actually. I would say in, in this whole big long list of reasons why it's important to manage your data, human error certainly is at the very top of the list. Um, there are so many ways that things can go wrong when managing data. Many of you have used flash drives or even external hard drives. It's very easy to lose storage devices, right? Even if you haven't lost a storage device, they are corrupted very easily. I worked with an education faculty member at a previous institution who no longer had access to her PhD data because all of her PhD data was on an external hard drive that was corrupted. And she had worked with people in IT in her department. She had, nobody could extract the information from that material. There are PhD students who lost years of research when their laptop was stolen or when they lost their laptop. And who's going to be able to redo that? That could effectively end your career, right, as a graduate student at least, because you're not going to get the funding, you're not going to have the time to go back and rerun those experiments. So there are just so many ways that things can go wrong um, that are operator error, um, and even not operator, format obsolescence, right? Formats, data formats, um, storage media, they're changing all the time. Um, so you may not be able to go back and read that information. Natural disasters. Um, there are many instances of people who have lost data because of natural disasters, um, be it on a small scale or on um, a large scale where entire servers you know, were destroyed. So you know, there's a, a big long list. It could go on and on. It's just very important if you do not want to lose your data forever for whatever reason, it's really important to um, manage it properly, to store it properly, to back it up properly. Um, these are all considerations that you have to um, think about all the time. So another, a few other issues when I'm working with graduate students and when I'm working with faculty and talking to them about data management that I emphasize include retractions, right? Journal re article retractions are on the rise. So people are, in question, are increasingly questioning the results of studies. In this case, there was a paper that was retracted because the authors were not able to provide the original data associated with the project. So if somebody accuses you of using fraudulent data, or if somebody simply questions your results, they, they don't believe based on studies that they've done that are similar, that your results are valid. If you can't provide access to that data, then you know there's no way you can justify your conclusions. There are a lot of faculty who will tell you that they are sharing data when they publish a journal article. But I would challenge anybody to replicate an experiment based on the data that you find in a journal article, right? It is just not something um, that is likely to happen. And it has to be usable. So simply holding up a flash drive, you know, or an external hard drive and saying my data is here is not enough. Like, can people make sense of your data? Have you included a data dictionary or a readme file that explains what all the variables are? What equipment did you use? What version of equipment did you use? These are all this is all information associated with data collection and data management that it's important to be able to provide access to because otherwise people are not going to be able to try to replicate your experiments. This is simply a, a few charts that show that journal retractions are on the rise. So from 2013 to 15, you can see every year there was an increase in the number of retractions. Um, the percentage increase in 2015 was 37%. So this is something that I really emphasize, especially to graduate students, um, because your credibility is on the line, right? I mean, there are a lot of reasons why a retraction is bad news, whether you're a faculty member or, um, or a graduate student. It's also possible that new discoveries can be made with your data, even if, in this case, the new discovery, I believe, was made um, by the people who actually captured the images with the Hubble Space Telescope. But many people use data that other people collect for reasons that they never could have anticipated, right? So in this case, 11 years after this image was taken, they were able to find new information embedded in those images because they had access to equipment that wasn't available when the images were first captured. If they had not properly um, stored and backed up and preserved and maintained the integrity of these images, that would have never been possible, right? I have been to presentations of faculty who 
work in the sciences that don't have their own lab, like 100% of their research is using data that other people collect. So it's really important to manage that data properly and, and to be thinking, you know, how might people use this data? Because it's, whether or not it's usable really depends on how well you have managed the data throughout your project. So some general benefits to the researcher include increasing the impact and visibility of research. This is important to both faculty and students. Um, it promotes innovation and in new data uses. Um, it leads to new collaborations. I really push this to graduate students because they're all about building those networks. Um, maximizes transparency and accountability. So this gets to the journal retraction, right? It gets to compliance. Um, it's increasingly important that you be able to show that what you, you really did what you said you did and that your results are valid. So issues for researchers, creating this data management plan, you know, so NSF started requiring that data management plans be included in 2011. So that's like six years ago now, I guess. Um, initially, NSF did not actually score the data management plans when they um, determined whether or not to award a grant. Um, that's changing. They gave researchers some time, right, to get used to the process, to get used to the system. Um, it is now really um, becoming more of an issue because they are being graded on those data management plans. You have to actually be able to do the things you propose to do. This is a problem early on when um, this rule first, when this mandate first happened, a lot of libraries were providing um, sort of boilerplate language that, that faculty members could use, right? Because that's super convenient to go in and say, here's an example of what you would say on how you want to store your data. Um, but what we found is that researchers were going in and copying and pasting that boilerplate language into data management plans without understanding what they were saying they were gonna do. Right, so, you know, just because it was a matter of course, they had to submit the state of management plan, they didn't really care. Um, it was just checking off the box, right? So it's really important now, you know, researchers are getting these reviews back saying, you know, this is not possible. You have got to be able to propose something that is a viable solution um, for managing your data. Um, managing data workflow, there are librarians, we aren't doing this here, but there are libraries that actually embed librarians into research groups and they really provide a lot of guidance on the entire data management process right that's an investment that's a resource issue but there are um, libraries who are doing that using data management best practices um, primarily I do teach this to graduate students and in my experience graduate students really understand the need um, they are in a lab setting oftentimes where they are given, you know, maybe responsibility over one aspect of a project. And maybe they're told how to manage the data associated with that one aspect of a project. But, you know, they are expected when they leave to go off and become faculty and researchers in their own right and manage the data associated with entire projects. And they are not in most cases, given the instruction on how to do that, right? Which is why we have so many bad data management practices. Um, it, it, it's pervasive across disciplines. So this is an issue, um, they recognize it's an issue, but they don't know, researchers and faculty are notorious, not just for data management, of assuming that graduate students know more than they do. Right, so it's, it's not just a matter of educating the graduate students on best practices, it's educating the, the faculty and the researchers that their graduate students need this instruction. Um, that is one major area of outreach, I think, for people in data management services. Creating consistent metadata, as I said earlier, faculty don't really understand not all of them. I've talked to some faculty that really had a, a tight understanding of metadata, but many of them don't really understand metadata as a concept in terms of data management, how to plan for it at the beginning of a project. Um, so there are many libraries that have metadata librarians, which is traditionally a back of the house kind of service, who are now becoming much more front facing, right? They are providing metadata services as a public service, as a part of a comprehensive suite of 
research data management services. So that's becoming much more common. Um, sharing and getting credit for their work, just telling them how they can do this and why it's important. Documenting compliance, which is increasingly important, um, both institutionally, through funding agencies, um, that sort of um, thing. So, very briefly, the University of Kentucky, not every institution has a data retention policy, so we should be very glad that we do. Um, it tends to be very vague, as most of them tend to be. Um, it is currently under review, so I am chairing a university-wide group that was tasked by the Office of the Vice President for Research at reviewing the data retention policy and making recommendations. We've done that, and this semester we're in the process of revising this policy, so it will probably be changing, um, hopefully by the summer. Um, but for right now, the essence of the policy is that UK owns data resulting from scholarly activity undertaken at UK. This is something graduate students really don't understand. Uh, a lot of graduate students assume if I do the research, this data belongs to me, right? And um, that is not in fact the case and it matters because um, it's important, especially for their faculty advisors, that they maintain um, that data once students leave. And I have talked to faculty who had millions of dollars worth of research grants who could not tell me if he had all of the data from all of his graduate students, um, the data that they produced. So it doesn't mean you can't take the data with you, but you have to leave a copy of it here, right? So that is something that it's very important to um, inform students and researchers and faculty about. The retention period here at the University of Kentucky is five years, um, but we do make sure to um, let people know that if you are being funded by an agency that has a longer period, um, like seven years, you defer to the longer period. So there might be a project that has multiple different um, retention periods. You always defer to the period that's the longest to make sure that you're in compliance with everything. Um, data must be retained sufficiently for reconstruction and evaluation, which, which gets back to simply handing over a hard drive with raw data on it with no documentation or explanation of the process that was used to analyze your data. That's not, that's not really sharing your data, right? If it's not understandable, you're not sharing your data. And the investigator is responsible for retaining or ensuring retention of the data and providing access to it. So this is tricky at an institution like the University of Kentucky, where we don't really have infrastructure to provide a place for all faculty and researchers and graduate students to put their data. Um, so one of the roles that we take upon ourselves, Adrian does this, I know I've done this and Robert's probably done this too, is to help researchers find an appropriate place to store their data. There are plenty of options out there. Some of them are free, some of them are not, but there, some of them are discipline specific, some of them are very broad and generic. Um, that is one area where we can certainly offer support now. Um, and you know, maybe this will change. Um, maybe we will end up with data infrastructure here on campus that will allow um, for some of this data to be here. Although I will say UK knowledge, it is possible to use UK knowledge for some data. If you're working with, you know, petabytes or terabytes of data, maybe not. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, many researchers deal with data that's much smaller in scale. And in that case, you know, Adrian certainly could talk with them and tell them if it's possible for them to keep it here. So federal mandates, I've already talked about a little bit. Um, this was all driven by a, a mandate coming out of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to make publicly funded data available, which I, I guess is becoming an interesting topic today, right? But we won't, I won't go there. Um, and that's what really prompted funding agencies to start putting these mandates in place. So um, NSF, as I said, it was an early adopter, 2011. That's when it really started. Since then, as far as I know, all federal funding agencies now require a data management plan of some sort. Um, the requirements are different, which is why DMP tool, which I'm going to show you in just a few minutes, is very helpful because it takes the onus off of you of knowing what all the specific requirements are for all the data management plans because it provides sort of a template for all the prompts that all of these different funding agencies ask you to answer these questions. 
Um, so, well-managed, publicly accessible data is important. It enables scrutiny of research findings for your own edification, for um, transparency, for compliance, for protecting yourself, right, which is important as well. Um, it encourages the validation of research methods. It reduces the cost of duplicating data collection, and it just saves you time so you don't have to go back and try to um, frantically gather information you maybe didn't um, gather to begin with. It provides resources for education and training. You know, there are just many reasons that I haven't even gone over for why data management is important, um, but those are a few. So in terms of data services and academic libraries, I think this is my last slide before we start doing stuff. Um, I, I tend to think of them as falling into four general categories. So providing faculty support, for example, um, providing data management plan consultations, which we do, we haven't really pushed it, as a service um, because there's always the you know what happens if everybody takes you up on that offer right i think libraries all around the world deal with these questions um, but that is one example of support um, for faculty educating graduate students i think is really an important role for all academic libraries because they really do not get that data management um, training in their curricula there are some differences like you UPenn, I think Penn, um, requires PhD students in chemistry to take um, a, an infor a chemical information course that goes over um, data management best practices, right? But it's very ad hoc. It's very sporadic. It just depends on a particular department or in a particular college and a particular institution understanding the importance. It's certainly not pervasive. Developing human infrastructure, which is kind of what this is, right? Um, just providing some opportunities for librarians and staff and graduate students who work in libraries, who went to graduate school um, at a time not that long ago, really, when this kind of training just wasn't available. And I think that's where some of the nervousness about data service comes from. So that's what we're trying to rectify with these workshops. And then data infrastructure, some libraries and some universities have it, some don't. We don't really have good data infrastructure here, but like I said, you know, maybe that'll change. Oh, I will point out before finishing this part, there is a research data management at UK Research Guide. Many of you have already seen this, but I wanted to point it out again. While it does have my name and contact information on it, um, at least on the front page, this is actually now being managed by the Research Data and Scholarly Communication Committee. Um, so I am not the only person responsible for maintaining this page. Um, I will show it to you very quickly if it allows me. <laughs> All right, so is, I'm going to have to share this. Okay, hang on just a minute. There had to be one challenge, right? It's gone way too smoothly. Okay, okay, so this research guide has just some, it's not overwhelming in terms of the amount of information, but I do think it has information that will help. Um, it's got some getting started information. It does have a link to DMP tool, which we're going to go into in just a minute. But if you're working with faculty or students, you don't have to remember the URL, right? You can just go to this research guide and the link is right there. Um, I've also got a page with data management and from support information, not just for us. So this has all of our information, mine, Adrian's, Robert's, Carla, who um, is our copyright expert and can provide um, a lot of um, expertise in this area in the social sciences. But I've got information on the Office of the Vice President for Research. Um, I've got information on IRB training. Some graduate students actually suggested that I put that there in engineering. So if you ever have ideas about content that we could put on this guide to make it more useful, um, please let us know. Anybody on the committee can bring it um, to the table. You kit, I'm gonna have to change this. It's you kit now, right? Not you cat. So um, some really general grant requirement information, some basic information on data types and metadata. There are a million different metadata standards, but here are some of the more common ones. If you're working with people and you just can't think of um, where to start. 
data repositories, a few links that will help you look for different data repositories in various disciplines, and then some general um, information on data sharing and reuse. So that's just for your use. You know, it's handy if you're at the reference desk, perhaps, and somebody comes up and they have a question, or even if you have a faculty member and you don't deal with data management on a daily basis, this will maybe refresh your memory. Okay. So now, are there any questions before we get into DMP tool? Robert? Nothing. Okay. Everything's perfectly clear. Um, okay, so DMP tool. For those of you both here and at home, please log into DMP tool. The URL is here on the screen. Um, it's a pretty short URL, or you can even go to that research guide if you're already there and click on the link. Okay. Maybe I didn't link it. Hmm. We don't want to do that. Okay, so once you get to um, DMP tool, you want to click on getting started. When I log in, my my log in my um, dashboard is going to look a little different than yours, but go ahead and click on getting started. Choose your institution. So we are an institutional member. So scroll down to the University of Kentucky and it will ask you to log in with your link blue information so you don't have to learn another username and password. Okay, once you get here, um, I don't think you're going to have quite as many options across the top, but what it's really important for you to know, both for yourself and for any faculty or graduate students who have a, a Link Blue account can use DMP tool, um, and you can create new DMPs. And I'm going to work you through this process, and we're going to talk about this case study. Because time is an issue, I'm not going to ask that you actually create a data management plan, which is what I would do if I had the time. But this will at least show you how to go through the process. So if you click on create a new DMP, it will give you the op opportunity to select a template. And like I said, there are many different funding agencies, right? Not just federal funding agencies, but private agencies, foundations um, who provide grants. It would be impossible for anyone person to sort of keep up with what the data management requirements are. The nice thing about DMP tool is it, it, the people who manage it on the back end keep all of these policies updated. So NSF, it's actually changed a little. I found I had to um, change um, some of the documentation in one of the handouts because it's changed a little. So if you go down and click on National Science Foundation, you will see that there is um, a link for all of the different directorates. So NSF has 12 different um, directorates that are specific to the area um, where you do research. So if you just go down to generic, click on NSF generic. It's not gonna, yeah. Okay, so then you'll see it gives you the opportunity. You put in your the title of your project. You can put in your solicitation number, um, the proposal deadline. You can make it public so other people can see it, or you can keep it private. You can create a practice when you can share a data management plan with others. So that's very useful because many grant, many projects are collaborative. So you could both go in and work on a data management plan separately. It's kind of like Google Drive, right? So you create that. I'm gonna say I'm gonna keep it private. Click on save or next, and then it walks you through the five different components of a data management plan that the National Science Foundation requires. So if you go in, you can see, so we, we worked on this in our workshop last year, and we found it, some people found it a little more challenging to get in and use the system than we anticipated. You can blow this text up into full so you can see it, but this is what I gave you in a handout. So if those of you um, have the handout, Catherine, do you have the handouts? Could you bring me? 
what I did on the, um, let me see what I titled the standout. Thank you so much. So data, NSF data management plan DMP prompts. All this is, is I copied and pasted the text from these five categories in DMP tool on the paper so that you had it more easily accessible because it is a little cumbersome to get in and actually see them online. Um, but these prompts give you really specific details about the kind of information that NSF is looking for when you write your data management plan. So this is very helpful. Um, when you're providing guidance to people because a lot of people i think we're going to probably be marketing dmp tool um, more than we have in the past but if they've got questions this is helpful for you as well right and it's helpful for you you can use this personally in your own research even if you don't ever share it with students or faculty so you type in your response right you would go to next you would work through all of the different prompts and then preview DMP, basically it's just gonna crunch it all together into a document with different paragraphs. You might have to do some modification of this. You might wanna tweak it with formatting and that kind of thing. But still, it's very helpful to have a place where you can do this. And what's nice is you go up to your dashboard and you can collect all of the data management plans that you have generated over the course of your career, right, which is very helpful because sometimes maybe you can reuse a data management plan with just minor modifications. You don't necessarily have to recreate the will. Um, and you can, I will point out before we go out of here, that you can click on the public DMPs option if you want to look at a few DMPs and see um, see what they look like in different disciplines. Um, the one downside, I think it would be incredibly beneficial for us as librarians and for faculty and graduate students if we had a database of um, awarded grants so that we could see data management plans that are solid and that were approved. The problem is um, nobody can really make somebody share that information with you. Not even the Office of the Vice President for Research can force somebody to share that information. So these are plans that people have created, but we have no way of knowing if they were awarded the grant unless they put that information in there. Okay. All right, so Robert said that the proposal development office here on campus, if you go and you want to see an example of a data management plan, perhaps in your field, they will go out and solicit data management plans of people so that you have an example during the workshop. Okay, so that that's very good to know. And the, um, I don't know if it is it the proposal development office or the office of the vice president for research more generally that has the library with links to different resources on campus. I didn't, I'll send out, maybe, I'll, I'll try to find some of this information and send out a follow up to this session with that information. So anyway, that's because we don't have a whole lot of time to actually work within the system. I did want to get you in there. Were you all able to successfully, can everybody raise their hand online if you create, not in here, uh, raise, raise your hand online if you were able to successfully get into DMP. Everybody's good? Okay. Getting a lot, oh, I can see them, look. <laughs> okay, so that's really it for the online presentation. What I want to do now is with these two handouts that I gave you, what time is it? How much time do we have? And this is until 3.30, right? Okay, so that's perfect. All right, so I'm going to give you a minute. I don't know, I didn't ask you to read this because typically in my experience, nobody does it anyway. Um, so it is relatively brief, so I'm going to give you like five minutes to read this Rat Heart case study. Um, I apologize for the content. Some of you might find it a little disturbing, um, but, but um, it is quite brief and easy to read, so I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Okay, the recording is being paused. It's beginning again. Okay. Okay. So what I want you to do, um, based on this case study, and it's fine to talk through this, right? There's no, there are problems with this case study. This case study was actually, um, is a part of the NECDEMIC 
um, material that you can find online. So NECDEMIC stands for the New England Collaborative <laughs> Data Management Curriculum. All right, so you can find it just NEC DMC online. It is, it was a part of an NIH grant funded project. There is a tremendous amount of information um, online through NECDEMIC. It's can be a little overwhelming. Um, and they do have some research cases like this, but I greatly modified this case study. I didn't think, it was very much stream of consciousness. Um, it was actually obtained from an actual researcher and they didn't edit it at all. And I just didn't feel like you could really do anything with it in a class setting. So this is um, greatly abbreviated for um, ease of use. So what I'll ask you, so look at your um, data management plan prompts. The first question is types of data produced. So tell me, what kinds of data do you notice that you would have to worry about managing in this particular scenario? There are slides. So people, that's a very good observation because a lot of people assume data management is all about digital data right but act, management of actual physical materials is an issue too um, it's fine if you've got all of your electronic data saved but if you can't go back and access those the slides that were important for your research then maybe it, it doesn't all matter so um, physical specimens certainly what else images um, images from multiple sources right so you've got two different cameras You've got um, two different kinds of microscopes that are taking images at any given time. And it says, so approximately 10,000 images per experiment um, were collected. So think about what's entailed in managing that. If you don't manage that properly, it would be very challenging, even for people involved in the experiment, um, to go back and um, do anything with this data. And while I included, let me see, I included in your um, data management plan prompts, I swear this was part of the NSF DMP requirement um, before this number six, roles and responsibilities. That is actually not in the system now as a requirement. I don't know if NSF dropped that or maybe it's just dropped from the generic template, but I think that's actually very important. So I went ahead and kept the prompts there so that it's something that you could think about if you ever need to, um, think through this kind of problem because I mean look at the lab group here I'm going a little off topic but if you look at lab group responsibilities you had um, multiple research staff could be analyzing the same heart one person measures the mechanical function of the heart one person stains the samples one person is responsible for the imaging I'm imagining maybe different people did different kinds of imaging because you had two different kinds of microscopes, you had two different cameras. The data set should all be linked in the Excel spreadsheet, um, but everybody is responsible for entering your own data. So do you have proper protocols, right? Are you using the same file naming conventions? This is a big issue when we're talking about metadata and Catherine will talk about this more in, I think it's the next session, right? The next session on metadata, Catherine's really gonna get into this in more detail. Um, but it's very important to make sure everybody's using the same conventions or else when you try to pull this together, you know, mistakes are going to be made. Um, you had 10 people involved in the data analysis. Um, there was one lab notebook for the entire group with observational notes, with a paper surgical log. The lab notebooks were kept in the PI's office. Um, this is way off topic. I wasn't planning on really going on this rant. But um, I mean, think of all the potential problems here in terms of data management, right? If you do not have proper system in place to make sure everybody's on the same page, you are gonna lose a lot. this data. Some of it's gonna fall through the cracks, right? You're gonna follow inconsistent procedures and it's just gonna be very, difficult for you to properly manage and make that data available should you want to share that data in the end and i'm assuming this is probably an nih funded project right um that, that's an assumption on my part but if it is you know nih has a policy if you're funded by if your funding is over five hundred thousand dollars you have to make your data publicly accessible right are you collecting your data in such a way that you can make it accessible in a meaningful way um, i would 
argue that perhaps not in this case. So anyway, yeah, so that was data types. Let's go back to, sorry, I'm shuffling multiple pieces of paper here. All right, so what about metadata and metadata standards? Do they um, provide any information at all? that you could, like if you were filling out a data management plan, what would you be able to say about their metadata practices? Catherine's looking. This is where we're really gonna find out because we've got Catherine here. I'm um, what? Yeah, well, the screen, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not really referring to anything in particular on the screen right now anyway. So all I could glean, and I'll ask Catherine, so they're using spreadsheets, right? So they are collecting metadata, um, but we don't know what it is because the metadata would be every, you know, every field that they are collecting would be a metadata field, um, but there is no specific information here on a metadata standard or the file naming conventions or any kind of protocol in that way. It doesn't appear as if there's a data dictionary or a readme file. Right, right. You would hope that they're documenting what the columns are, but right, you don't, or who's doing what, right? Are they documenting who's collecting the data, what the equipment is, what version of the equipment they're using? And it looks like Right, computer code, a lot of people don't think of computer code as data, but that is important, right? Um, so that is also a consideration. And it, they, it looks like they're using paper notebooks that are kept in the PI's office, but data sets are backed up on an external hard drive at some place. I should have put someplace in quotes. I don't know where the mysterious someplace is. Um, so there are a lot of issues here, right? In terms of documentation, maybe they're doing it and that simply wasn't captured when the librarian sat down with the faculty member and gathered this information. Um, but from what is in this very brief, um, incredibly <laughs> um, consolidated data management or um, research case study, that information is not available. Do you have any other observations, Catherine? that might pertain to metadata? Right, all of the information associated with instrumentation that people are using is very important. Right, and it, again, I've mentioned version. Version control is important with data management, period, no matter what you're doing. But it's important as well for instrumentation because you know these things change and that could affect your results right if you were going to run an experiment on an instrument that is um, several versions or updates out of out of date so anyway that's metadata let's see are there other questions here um, under the metadata file formats again please tune into our next workshop this is a plug Catherine is fantastic and she is going to go over um, very specific metadata stuff. Policies for access and sharing, I couldn't find anything on here. So tell me what would be some, I could just shut this off. The computer is getting glitchy, but I can't do that, can I? <laughs> Robert's like, no, don't shut it off. Okay, so what would be some consideration? Looking at the prompts that I gave you, your NSF data management plan prompts, what would be some things that they would have to think about? An embargo period. So why might they need to use an embargo period? So Valerie is head of our Agricultural Information Center. So it's a matter of how soon they want to share the results due to publishing them first and those can be shared. Right. So this is an issue. Um, you know, this is a sharing issue, and maybe Robert and um, Adrian will get to this in their session. But, you know, it's always a challenge getting people to share their data 
when, you know, they want to squeeze it dry, right? They want to get every possible publication out of that data that they can before making it accessible to other people because they're scared they're going to get scooped, right? Maybe somebody is going to, you know, make the discovery or publish on their research before they do. So an embargo period, certainly, you could go ahead and upload your data to a repository, perhaps, and put an embargo period on it that would give you time to um, do what you need to do, but still it would be there in such a way that it would be accessible once that embargo period was lifted. Do you have anything, Adrian, to add? No, just about sharing and access using this case study. I'm putting Adrian on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ah, oh, okay. All right. Well, that's a good point. Okay. So Adrian said, if you journal, in, if you publish in the Public Library of Science (PLOS), right? They have a whole big series of journals. If you publish in a PLOS journal, and this isn't just true for PLOS, uh, uh, different journals have different similar requirements. Um, they require that you make your data accessible once the article becomes acceptable, uh, accessible, right? It needs to be simultaneous. That it doesn't so it varies really from art from journal to journal. Some journals will let you associate data as supplementary material um, within that journal itself. Some simply want to include a link. Um, they say you can put your data in a repository somewhere else and you can simply link to it. Um, maybe they don't require that you, um, th maybe they just say that you have to share it. There could be people with very general requirements. So these are all considerations. If a researcher knows that they want to publish in a certain journal, and that journal specifies that you have to share your data, that's good to know right before you start your project so that you can determine, I mean, maybe a journal or maybe a repository that you want to use requires that your data be in an accessible format, right, not proprietary. But maybe your data was collected on instrumentation that was proprietary, and maybe your data has to be converted. Um, so that it is accessible to people. Um, it would be great to know that before you start data collection, right? Because you can work that process into your workflow. If you find out right when you're getting ready to upload your data to a repository that you have to go back and you have to do all of this conversion, that could be time prohibitive, it could be cost prohibitive, there could be a lot of problems associated with that. So this is a reason why um, it's really important that you think about access and sharing before you even start. And this is something, you know, this gets to, this is falling into the area outside of what researchers typically think about, um, in my experience at least, when they begin a project. They're not thinking about what they're going to do once they're done, right? Okay, so that was, um, let's see, that was policies for access and sharing. We've got policies for reuse and distribution. Really, none of these were addressed. And I think this gets to what I just said. Um, when they were talking, when the librarians at the University of Massachusetts Amherst is where this came from, um, when they were sitting down with the researcher, they simply asked the researcher to talk about their project. Um, and so it basically ended with data collection and analysis, right? This is exactly what I was talking about. Let me see if I can actually get back to it. This is what I was talking about. here, right? As far as research is concerned, once you get past data analysis and you write your article and you publish it, you're done, right? They're, they're not thinking ahead to the, the data sharing and reuse. So let's, let's look at those prompts really quickly. So restrictions, okay, do you think there would be any kind of um, restrictions on the data associated with this, re re uh, with this research. So they're doing experimentation on animal. They're doing animal research, right? So that does have a lot of requirements up front in terms of getting permission to do that, but it's not human subject data. 
um, when you're dealing with human subject data, often there are a lot of requirements. You know, you have to um, make sure that it's not identifiable, the information when you share it and things of that nature. There are a lot of requirements. In this case, I'm not sure. I mean, they're doing, you know, animal research. I'm not sure if there would be any restrictions in um, that case. But you do have to think. So there are, I, I have worked with people, um, researchers in different fields who say, sure, you know, I'll share my data, but it's not in a repository. You know, it's sitting in a, a desk drawer on a hard drive or in a filing cabinet. So, you know, if people, if you make the hurdles so great that people can't really access your data, are you really sharing your data? You know, I would argue no. I mean, it sort of gets to the whole metadata thing as well. Um, if you've got to, you've got to look at a journal article, perhaps, right? It's not published somewhere. You've got to figure out who the authors were. Maybe only one of the authors has the data. Right, so you've got to contact somebody. You're assuming they're going to respond because they can say that they're willing to share, but if they don't respond to your email or to your phone calls, then you have no way of getting that from them, right? And then you're basing the assumption that the shared data will actually make sense to you because they created a README file or data documentation that would allow you to use the data. So it's fine to say that you're sharing data, but there are many parts to access that you have to consider um, beyond just, you know, theoretical um, agreement. It's much easier, it's always better to recommend that they find some kind of repository because then it's just out of sight, you don't have to worry about it. You know, it's out there. You can just, if people do contact you, you can just point them um, to the link to the repository and it's all handled. All right, so that was reuse and distribution, um, archiving and preservation. Again, I would just say, but it's 317. Um, you know, the consultation that needs to happen in terms of archiving and preservation, um, in my opinion, is largely based on understanding what you need to preserve long, time, long term. So I have worked with chemistry faculty who swore up and down that raw data my nobody would understand my raw data right only i can understand my raw data um it would be way too com complicated and convoluted i mean he swore up and down there was absolutely no benefit in um preserving or storing or making accessible the raw data associated with the project but i would argue that typically that is what you want to store, right? You don't necessarily have to store, I mean, maybe not always, but you don't necessarily have to store the processed or analyzed data because maybe somebody wants to use the data in a way that you didn't, right? And they would have to do their own analysis anyway. But in order to do that, they would need the raw data associated with the project in order to do that kind of um, analysis. But maybe there are some different parts of um, the data that were collected or processed or analyzed over the course of a project that are very important to preserve for whatever reason. Um, by working with somebody who is an expert in that area, um, that's very beneficial. This is one reason why we have multiple people in the library system who provide these kinds of services, right? I mean, if I have a really complicated metadata question, I mean, I can answer metadata questions for sure, but I would contact Catherine, right? Because Catherine is our metadata librarian and she knows metadata better than anybody, arguably here. Um, you know, and it goes the same for, you know, data sharing and uh, repositories. That would be an Adrian thing. So we do have a lot of resources here. We've got Sarah Dorpinghouse now, who's not with us here today, but you know, she has a great deal of experience in archiving and preservation, and she would be able to perhaps consult with somebody um, on that kind of issue. So that's the kind of thing that we as a committee are really trying to wrap our brains around, right? Like what does comprehensive data management services at the University of Kentucky look like? Um, and I think that those are the conversations we're having. Um, that's the kind of information we're trying to gather with this um, sort of campus survey that we are gonna have access to those results shortly. Um, but anyway, those are the kinds of things that you have to think about with archiving and preservation. You know, how long will it be preserved? Where will it be stored? Um, 
you know, do you need additional information? Again, these prompts provide a lot of helpful um, information when you are thinking through these processes. And then roles and responsibilities, we already kind of talked about. Um, Again, you know, it's hard to do this. I'm done. It's hard to do an activity. Valerie's given me a time sign. Um, it's hard to do this kind of activity when you've only got an hour and a half to do a presentation. And I wanted to get you into DMP tools so you could create an account and learn what it is and understand that it's a resource you can use yourself and that you can share with your patrons. Um, and I also wanted to talk through the case study because I think it's different when you hear, okay, metadata, what about metadata? When you've actually got a case study, you can think about what they did wrong and what they did right. Um, I do think that's beneficial. So hopefully you did get something out of that. I'm not sure, are there any questions before I wrap this up? Does anybody, Robert, are there any questions online? No, Beth has a question. Sure. So I've actually had um, Kathy Gretsch, who is um, director of the PDO, I believe. Um, she has come and spoken with us multiple times. She has actually referred people to me. Um, and they have included my information. So the, the question for those of you who may not have heard is does the proposal development office review data management plans? They, they will for sure, and they, they will collect data management plans to provide as examples, but I have had them ask me um, if I would be willing to consult with people who need consultation, and I know they have included my, not in every single one of those grant bulletins, but they have included my information in some of the grant bulletins that get pushed out to, to researchers on campus, saying if you need help with this, please contact Christy Peters. But this is one of the reasons I was saying it's so important for there to be an inner unit, interdepartmental, campus-wide group because no one, no one unit can do it all. You know, everybody's underfunded and understaffed. And um, so hopefully, you know, with this committee in-house and with the campus-wide committee that seems to be, you know, sort of gaining momentum, hopefully we'll be able to work some of that out. Um, so it's, I guess, it, yes, but it's complicated, is my answer to that. Is there anything else? Okay, so Catherine, you have an assessment. How are, are we going to distribute that just in an email? Okay, so we have an assessment for this workshop. I'm assuming we'll have the same assessment probably for all of our workshops. Um, I will send out an email to everybody who participated both in person and virtually. Please be honest. You know, this is the first time we've done this whole live streaming thing. Um, let us know if there are ideas you have for additional future workshops, please let us know that as well. Like linked data, I think would be great. Um, I, I'm sure there are other ideas for um, workshops that would be helpful um, and we would appreciate your feedback. But thank you for coming, for participating. We appreciate it. Yay. <laughs>